When Kerry Hume won the Booker Prize for the Bone People, she took the literary world by surprise. The judge's decision was far from unanimous, but their doubts did not affect her fans, who were not only fascinated by the book, but by Hume herself, a part Maori, part Scot, who lives in a very remote area of New Zealand. Kerry, it's been 12 years since The Bone People, and your publishers, I know, have been waiting for about seven years for a manuscript called Bait. What's taken so long? Inertia, apathy, sloth. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm one of those people who can write while everything is going well with self and family. When things don't, the writing tends to be put on a back burner. And the last three, four years for my family have been pretty horrific. And as a result, I've done very little concluding work on Bait. Bait's pretty well finished. It's a matter of tossing up between three different endings. Also, and um, this, this, is, this really is excusing myself, I got involved with another novel while I was writing Bait, and that is not a good idea. But um, Joe McMillan at, uh, Mackenzie at Macmillan in New Zealand will have Bait before the end of this baiting season. Are you sure? Yeah, Can you positive. promise that? Yes, um, saving divine intervention, earthquakes, things like that. <laughs> now, how are you going to choose between those three endings? Well, that that's what I've been doing, doing for the last six months. Are we talking about choosing between a happy ending, a sad ending, and, and a general catastrophe? Mm. Uh, sort of. Whatever ending I finally opt on, I'm pretty well sure I've got it now, is I've got to rewrite back a little bit, as it were. So all the threads are drawn towards that ending quite conclusively. But that's been what I've been doing in a, um, a concentrated fashion for the last six months. So how did this other novel creep up on you? In Bait, there's two characters who are designed as background scenery. <clears throat> One is the world's best fish and chip cook. Uh, I used to be a fish and chip cook. I have a certain fondness for the trade. She's also was designed as sort of a colourful character, and as much she's an extremely big woman, probably a Tongan. Um, and what is she doing in a small, remote part of New Zealand? And I uh, thought there's something more to you than I actually know about. Whenever I drew them, they had different shadows from their actual physical appearance. And if this sounds all a wee bit mystical and waffly it's not really it's just sort of the normal process of coming to grips with with what you're actually doing as a writer and uh, i discovered actually they were quite different from how i'd represented them and lurched from them into as it were creating another world which has been compulsively fascinating so your secondary characters were saying to you we're not secondary we want to be primary actually we are primary you just haven't recognized it yet is there any sense in which the fishing of white bait is also something of a distraction from writing? I'm an obsessive fisher. I love it very much. I'm normally following each tide, and these are either one or two a day, and I'm out baiting for three to seven hours a day. What's so interesting about fishing white bait? Explain this to me. <laughs> Uh, it's not a great spectator sport. You know, I've know, seen family and friends die of boredom on the bank. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it really is difficult to convey the thrill you can get from it. I mean, you're out there in quite cold water. Sometimes it's up near your neck level. You're baiting incoming surf that's coming into a lagoon. You're holding a massive net. I mean, it's, it's got a, a frame circumference of up to 12 feet and a 12-foot pole on it and you're using this to sieve waves. And most times, sieving the waves produces very little. And sometimes it produces enough white bait so you can actually count and name each one. It's quite hard work when the sea's running in, um, you know, with force. And it can be totally unsatisfying. But every so often, you'll pick up a big shoal of bait. You may get anything from a couple of kilos to 10, 15 kilos. And there is a particular thrill, not that all these perfectly beautiful little fish are going to die and shortly turn into fritters, but it's just the thrill of catching. And it's, mm, I've white baited now for 27 years, and it's the pivot of my personal year. I'd live for five o'clock in the morning, September the 1st. Given this extraordinary isolation that you've lived in mm. for such a long time, I'm trying to reconcile that 
with the extraordinary attention that you would have got when you won the Booker Prize? It would have been overwhelming if I didn't have the stability, the anchor of my family, um, who were never overwhelmed by it or even particularly impressed by it. Uh, they're much more impressed if I catch a lot of white bait. But it was a very controversial win, Kerry, oh, yeah, and was there a has been a lot written since. I'm thinking yep. of a particularly nasty piece in The Spectator that you may or may not have seen no, I don't in London, yeah. saying that um, it was not only a controversial choice, but a choice where it was made public that one of the judges, Joanna Lumley, had said that the book would only win over her dead, dead body. body. Yes, I was looking forward to the corpse. She's quite an attractive person. And, um, <laughs> It was just very nice of them, thank you, to, to give it to New Zealand in 1985. Um, and uh, I don't want to buy into any kind of great defence of it. You know, it was a book of its time. It's still around. I still receive mail from readers whom it's affected one way or the other. Uh, I still think there's, looking back on it, I had a, an opportunity to read it um, last year. And there's still bits that are very effective, thank you. <laughs> Deserved, don't mind. There's a lot of talk, Kerry, in countries like Australia and Canada, where there are indigenous cultures, mm. about cultural appropriation mm. at the moment. How is that debate affecting New Zealand? Oh, well, it's rather like um, dropping a large heavy object into a nest of wasps. And I've deliberately used the nest of wasps, they're exotic incomers into New Zealand. Um, there is a case going before the Waitangi Tribunal, this is the um, quasi-court body that exists to hear claims under the Waitangi Treaty, which was established in 1840 between Pākehā Māori representatives of the Crown and the Indigenous people. This particular case deals directly with cultural appropriation, but it has a wider bound. The claim is for all flora and fauna that were exported by Māori, plus cultural material, whether it be song or dance, drawing or carving, prayer or practice, is being claimed for Māori. Now, there's a lot of opposition from environmental groups, from artists who may use Māori motifs, from Oh, goodness, I suppose we could get the Spice Girls for using a rather zingy version of Taralpara's haka in there. Um, it's definitely a live issue. Because the claim has just gone before the Waitangi Tribunal, it's going to be another three, four months before all the evidence is, is heard in support of this. I should imagine the debate is going to be exceedingly furious once the ramifications are understood. And where do you stand on this issue? I stand on the idea which has been cherished by Kaitahu for a long time, and that is the concept of being a kaitiaki. And that means somebody who is a guardian who hands on. You take care of and then you hand on. Um, to be a kaitiaki doesn't mean that you restrict or appropriate everything for yourself and deny other people. It means that you take care of those things that are especially vulnerable, whether they be flora and fauna, or whether they be ideas that might not survive um, the kind of intense scientific scrutiny that's available today, or wouldn't survive in an atmosphere of disbelief and could be crippled or killed by that kind of disbelief. But I do not think, doesn't do anybody any good if you corral everything for yourself and just hold on to it. The tighter you hold on to something, the less air it's got and the sooner it's likely to die. Māori in New Zealand are alive and, I think, um, a powerful force within New Zealand society, to my mind, for two reasons. We've held on to the important things, te reo, the language. We've held on to our mana, our integrity, our dignity, where it pertains to things Māori. Um, the funeral ceremonies, our marae, are still alive and lively forces. Um, but we've also shared in the most intimate way. I um, come from a family where interbreeding between originally sealers and then other incoming peoples has been going on since 1780. We've shared in a big way. Um, and it's, it's a good sharing. It means that as long as you have a dialogue, you can, you're no longer 
treating one party as the other to be made into an enemy. That kind of sharing, I think, is limited in some respects. Uh, there are sacred matters that are not for everybody. Every people have these. I mean, imagine the hoha that would happen if I went into a Catholic um, church and stole the host. It's pr probably a criminal offence. It's certainly sacrilegious and would offend a great many people. There are, there are matters as sacred as that within Maoridom which you don't fling round to people who aren't aware of them. But I think when it comes to the way we have lived in our islands and the way we have been transformed by our islands, this makes us an elder people with something to share to a younger people who are still growing and changing. The Bone People by Kerry Hume is published by Picador.